Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here. Welcome to the show. Y'all, I am super, super pleased to have you here this week as we are kicking off a brand new series. And this one is extra special because it is four weeks of conversations with really and genuinely one of my favorite people on this earth. And who doesn't love a conversation between two good friends who apparently are not afraid to tell it like it is, no holds barred. I love friends that I am that comfortable with. You guys, I'm so pleased to bring you our first For the Love of Conversations series featuring Jen and Kelly. Yes. I had the distinct pleasure of hanging out with Kelly for a four-part series on her podcast. Our conversations just ran the gamut. We know that some of you guys listen to her, but many of you don't. And I loved this series so much. I wanted to make sure it got into my beloved listeners' ears as well. And even if you did hear it over on Kelly's show, I'm going to be adding some thoughts I've had since we spoke just to mix it up a little bit. So stick with us because we always like to keep things fresh around here, of course. So before we really dive into what this series is all about, I want to tell you more about Kelly because she is truly a gift to this earth. Kelly Corrigan, she's a podcaster. She's an author. She's really just an overall great human being. She's a daughter who still mourns the loss of her dad, a mom to her amazing daughters, a wife to her fantastic husband, a sister a good friend and a woman trying her best to leave this world a better and a brighter one for future generations. The way that I met Kelly, you guys, is because sometimes the internet makes friends out of people or more to the point, you are able to use the internet to make friends out of someone, which is exactly and precisely what I did. I read, this is easily a decade ago. I read Kelly's book called The Middle Place. It's a memoir. And that's one of my favorite genres anyway, but Kelly is a, she's a master writer. I don't even know what to say. Those of you who've read her work, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yes. Agree to agree. She's just an, she just has an incredible way of telling a story, but really of like getting to the, the heart of the thing of just stringing together a sentence that is so precise and so relatable that you think about it for weeks. So The Middle Place is one of my favorite books. If you've been in my world for a while, you know this. I've put it on every favorites list I've ever made about books. And so I've probably read it, I don't know, seven or eight times. One time I was reading it again because there was a bunch of shenanigans going out in my living room with the kids. This is when they were younger. And I was like, I don't want to be a part of this. I would like to not be in this loud room with these boisterous people. And I just want to not have it. So I went back to my bedroom and I locked the door and I grabbed the middle place, which is tried and true and started reading it again. And I just snapped a little picture and I put it on socials and just kind of said, you know, this is what I'm doing instead of being out like in the vortex of adolescent energy. And I had a picture of her book and I must've tagged her. I can't really exactly remember how this worked, but somehow she saw that and came in and commented that she was happy to keep me company or something like that. And I was like, Oh, Oh, don't think I'm going to grab onto this with both hands. And I think I literally forced us into a friendship. So I think that's the honest truth. And we became friends. And then we became real friends. It went more from being internet friends to real friends. And we started collaborating together and working together and building things together. And she came to my house and we did a whole backyard kind of small batch event. I don't know if you guys remember this. It was so cool. That was when her book, Tell Me More came out. And I think, let's see, maybe Moxie was coming out. Golly, I don't remember. And we are so seamless together. You're going to see this in the conversation. We just have this way about us where for some reason, when Kelly talks to me and says, that says things with some people, I'm able to just sort of smooth out an answer or, but not with her. Like she pulls something honest out in me. And I think I, and her, that the sum ends up being greater than its parts. We, Kelly and I did a whole tour together. We did a speaking tour together and it was just absolutely delightful. And we're always dreaming stuff up together. I call her for things. She calls me. I'm literally her fan and her friend forever. So I'm not going to give away too much here because I think you'll get a ton out of our very candid back and forth in these conversations over these next four weeks. We're going to kick it off 
was something that may be, I don't know, challenging for us to talk about. And that is dealing with change really in all of its forms. And as you know, I've had more than my share of change over the last two years. And guess what? I'm still here. (laughs) Even when the change that happens feels like the walls are closing in or your life as you know it has been ruined beyond repair, if that is how you feel, I'm living proof that change can lead to the most beautiful outcomes, even then, even out of that. And I'm telling you, it's not a Pollyanna take on it because I know how hard change is, especially when we don't expect it or we don't want it or we didn't choose it. At that point, it is hard to believe that something wonderful could occur out of it. Like you may have the imagination to think, well, something wonderful could occur in spite of it. But I'm here to say something wonderful can emerge out of it. But we talk about this in all of its forms, the breaking, the chaos, the reshuffling, the wondering if we'll survive phase. And I think you'll be able to hear yourself in this convo because we've all been there in one way or another. Every one of us has experienced major change in our life. So that's this week, but there is more. That will be followed up next week by friendship. And then the following week, beliefs we hold dear. And then finally, week four, the men that we love. And that one might surprise you. I know you'll want to stay around for that episode. It gets so real, y'all. So let's get into it. Let's talk about change because change has been, well, for a while, a harsh taskmaster in my life. And as I talk about in this episode, I am really, I feel like in, in some ways, of course, I am me and I have pride in that that I didn't ever lose me. I I never lost my own personal thread. But in in a few other ways, I'm different emerging from that change in better ways, in good ways, in strong and powerful ways. I'm going to share what that looks like. And Kelly will share her biggest takeaway from a change in her life. And I hope this conversation will help you see maybe the light or even a glimmer at the end of that dark change tunnel, if that is something that you're going through right now. So here we go our very first episode of For the Love of Conversations with Jen and Kelly, talking about the hard parts and the beautiful parts about change. Hey, Jen Hatmaker. Hi. How are you? I'm happy to talk to you. I've missed you. I know. I'm always happy to talk to you. I always learn something. Your special sauce is that you're a little more honest than the average bear. Mm. You know, that is a blessing and a curse, as you can well imagine. But I, I haven't figured out a different way to be in the world. And so until I come up with a system I can live comfortably inside, people are stuck with this. Speaking uh, of which, uh, this is an episode about change and changes. And I was thinking about the long list for both of us in terms of personal change, like marital status. Mm -hmm. And I've moved and left California after 29 years. And I have an empty nest now. I have changed some mindsets. I have changed some goals. Mm -hmm. But then I was also thinking about external changes, like how the culture is changing and how that may or may not affect the way we move around in the world. And Mm -hmm. so I thought I'd start by just asking, like, what? tell me the three biggest changes in your life in the last year. It's a good question. And and I think it's a timely conversation because the whole world is having forced right now to go through so many changes. And so I I don't find change a conversation that most people are comfortable with in general uh, or concept at all. And so I like that we're having this. Obviously, the biggest change for me is that I got divorced after 26 years of marriage. I grew up in a a weird little subculture where girls and boys for that matter tended to get married really young. Yeah. And so I was, you know, like a 19 year old Brian Kelly. I mean, we have 19 year olds. Can you even, No. can you even think of it? No, I know. We were kind of in this little strange bubble environment in college that was conservative, like highly Christian, traditional, even leaning fundamental. And so there was this strange way of being in college, which was just like, this is a pretty deep pool. We may never have better. Everybody like latch on to someone. And so when you said, hey, mom, I'm engaged, she was like, fantastic. She wasn't like, Jennifer (laughs) Hatmaker. 
<laughs> this is actually a point of contention between me and my mom all the time. I'm like, mom, like, where were you? I don't know why my mom didn't object more than she did. So all that to say, I literally married as a teenager. And so oh, I never spent a minute of my adult life as an independent woman. Never. I went straight from my dad's house to my dorm room to marriage. I don't have an adult gen outside of marriage. And so last year... think of all the growth that goes on in the years when you're floating around out in the world. So by contrast, I got married when I was 32. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I had signed leases and taken out small loans and purchased a car and had three jobs and I mean, exactly. incredible. And just slept alone every night. I mean, I, I think about that <laughs> with my kids a lot because I think it's yeah. so hard to be young because at the end of every day, you're alone. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard not to have somebody to process the world with. Except maybe it's nice to sleep alone. Yeah. Maybe you gave yourself the runway to develop a more complete worldview and to challenge the perspectives you grew up with and to rattle the cages of the community you were used to. Those changes are really for the the good of who we are, for the good of our character and our growth and our development. And, and facing a divorce in the summer of 2020, which was unexpected, by the way. It wasn't like a slow burn that we both eventually, you know, came to this conclusion. And it wasn't like that at all. It was like catastrophic shock and awe. And at the time, there wasn't a sliver of sun. I couldn't find it. I was all darkness, like plunged into darkness. And so then I was left 46 years old going, what do I do? Who? I don't know how much money I make. Like, I don't, <laughs> I've, I don't pay our bills. I've never bought a car. Where's our retirement? You know, just so behind on some standard adulting while I'm trying to get me and the kids like emotionally stable and remotely recovered from trauma. How many days did it take before you could have a minute or two pass without feeling terrible? Oh God, to be honest with you, that entire fall is so fuzzy. It's literally lost in some degree to a fog of just grief and shock. But I feel like I maybe laughed a few times Mm. come December. And this was started in July. It just took that long to think the sun would ever shine again. And And then you're just rotating through like a terrible wheel of horrific emotions, like anger and regret and and fury and confusion and self-loathing and loathing and... Every single emotion you just said, it was just a quagmire. And so that was a big change, like big, big, big. I mean, that changed every category of my life. My literal roles, like what do I do inside the family? The financial division of labor was something we had always agreed on. And so I had just handed that over decades ago and never picked that baton back up again. So that was a whole new set of learning experiences that I had to immediately engage. I mean, a 26-year marriage by any stretch is an accomplishment. And so having that really taken from me was confusing, embarrassing, humiliating. It was just, I wasn't quite sure what the next steps were going to be. It's interesting that we're talking about this a year and a half later because where I'm at today is so monumentally different than when I, where I was then. And so proof positive as we get into it here, that change, although it can be literally devastating, can also, and generally does turn out to be like a great and wonderful good. One of the ideas that I hold dear that you probably did too, is part of the reason why the cancer thing went so well. And part of the reason why you know, I bounced after my dad died was because of Edward. And so Mm -hmm. if there was something, if that were to shake loose, Mm -hmm. then I think I might have that same fear of like, wait a second, like I could do some things, I could weather some storms because I had this person. But if this person turns out to be untrue and part of the wrecking ball, Mm -hmm. then are we so sure that I'm so strong and resilient? You know, it's so true. And I know that you think that because that's your precious thing. And yet I'm sitting right here to tell you that you would and you could. There's something in us, even in literally the worst 
possible scenario that compels us to live, you know, that compels us to recover and to reach for hope and light and love. Well, that's Mm -hmm. so interesting because I remember talking to this phenomenal palliative care nurse. Her name was Meg and she was so beautiful and she was with me and my dad as he was dying and my brothers and my mom. And and she said, it's a lot of work to die. It's a lot of work. Mm. And so it takes a lot of effort to mm. lay down the will, which is wow. to say, you're right. Like we do want to live. Like we, there's something yeah. that's bigger than all of our thoughts, which yeah. is this instinctive nature to survive. You're right. And then there's this secondary layer that you can't control, but it will find you even in the darkest moment of your own despair, which is that even if you're not at that point yet, life still goes on around you with or without your permission. And so you find yourself being delighted against your will. Somebody is going to delight you because life is carrying on. Somebody is going to make you laugh just when you thought you might never smile again. You kind of get to borrow from their life force until your own returns. Tell me another change in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. In April of last year, four of my five kids lived here. And of course, I'm on my own now. And then as of about three weeks ago, only two of them are here. So me and Ben and Remy right now are the lone folks. And we just keep looking at each other like, no one's here. Like, this is an empty house. I'm like, why bother cooking dinner? There's only two kids here. Oh my God, and so my, my friends are like, do you know that some people, that's just what they have and they cook dinner their whole childhood. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So this is a brand new rhythm for me. I have literally never lived with this few people since I was a kid. And, and, so, and do you miss it? Like, is the chaos leaving a little bit of a hole? Is it okay if I say I don't? No, it's great like, if you say you don't because oh, there's everybody else out there is like, please uh-huh. say you don't. Please say you don't miss it. You'll kill me if you say you miss it. Like, I just don't. It my, You know my family. It's just, we're, we're chaos. We're just, so all of good, us are though. so I much. love it. We're I so love the loud. vibe at your house. I love it too, but it is a great deal. And so having a little bit of like white space, fantastic. I love it. You know, I'm introverted. I've had to just just pause on that for a second because there's nothing about you that feels introverted. Of course, I take you at your word. Like whether you can handle yourself at a party or whether you have a good time every now and then does not make you an extrovert. Totally. Tons of introverts are very socially competent. Susan Cain taught me that. Did you ever read her book? Yeah, she's amazing. She got a new one coming Um, out. She was my first teacher who taught me that I was an introvert. And it's like my life came into color. It threw the lights on in so many rooms where I had confused myself so thoroughly. I just couldn't make sense of it. Like, what is wrong with me? I thought I was broken or I had a malfunction or I was a bad person. So it turns out I just needed some quiet time to recharge. But Well, that's um, really interesting, which goes to like this change in self-perception. That's Mm -hmm. so valuable. And I I know you're like knee deep in Enneagram stuff. I have not done it myself. But the idea of like understanding yourself in a new way and therefore having your expectations change to something yeah. more appropriate is like really kind of groundbreaking. Like once you can say things out loud about who you are and who you are not, then you can build almost, a life that's like slightly yeah. more tuned to your innards, your insides. That's it. Learning that I was an introvert and how much that for some reason gave me permission to change some some of the structural parameters I had around my work, travel, my calendar and schedule. Uh, I had this sense that part of being a good leader, particularly kind of in my zip code, was to be essentially constantly available. And so when that just wore me out so bad that I, I hated everyone and I hated everything and I hated my job, I felt like, see, I'm not a good person. Mm -hmm. Like something is wrong with me internally that I hate people. Right, and And everybody's making me mad all the time. I'm mad at everybody. Why are they talking to me? (laughs) And so when I was like, oh no, 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 no. Like I can actually be optimized as a leader if I will just choose to build in some like breathing spaces into my, it changed my life. Like it changed my work. It changed the way I've dealt with my teams deadlines, everything. So what's something like that you have encountered as a grown-up that challenged a paradigm you had always thought about yourself? I mean, I have loved saying all these years that I'm not at all suited to be a writer because I'm an extrovert. Mm -hmm. 
every single reading you go to, people say, tell me when you work, what's your process or whatever. And it's a question I asked every single time I went to a reading. It was like, basically like, give me the formula. Tell me how to do it because I really want to do it. And I was walking with my friend, Arielle, who's been on the pod. She's a therapist and she's kind of brilliant. But anyway, she said, "Um, I'm sort of tired of hearing you put down the way that you work. Like it's Mm. working for you. You're getting a lot done and it's really (laughs) valuable work that you're doing and people appreciate it. So Mm. I was sort of enjoying putting myself Mm. down for the way that I worked, which was only because I had this fantasy about how other people work. And I assumed Uh. that, you know, the real writers wrote from five in the morning to 10 a.m., day (sighs) in and day out with just a sip of caffeine and they never missed a day sure. and they never missed a deadline and they never deleted a whole paragraph and called that the day's work. I mean, a huge thing for me is like to stop putting myself down. The other thing that that led to was this takeaway for me, which is you pick your emotion when you pick your expectation. And so if hmm. my expectation is that writing looks like this, this is how it works, this is how good people do it. Hmm. And, and then I don't hew to that model then I'm kind of a failure, even if I generate the books. That's right. And Mm. Arielle's like, but isn't the point of like being a writer to produce books every so often that people Mm. find worth reading? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Mm -hmm. "Mm mm-hmm. And she's like, well, then I would say that you can just go ahead and call yourself a fairly successful (laughs) writer. And it also helps me with Mm. Edward or my children who might make funny comments because we're kind of a teasing family. That's our culture. Right. And so they'll tease me for not getting something done or missing Mm. a deadline. And in the old days, I would smile, but inside I would take like a little hit. And now Mm. I just say, oh, this is how I work. Like, you let me know when you've written four books and now I'll I'll take some (laughs) advice. Like, this is how I work. I don't know. Oh, uh, that's really great. Uh, how many of our internal dysfunctions are tied to simply bad information of what we think everyone else is doing? I know, like, I know, could, I know. I hate that. I hate that. We could unravel so much in our own brains if we weren't just telling ourselves a story that's not even that true. Right, and that's why people like you are so important, Jen Hatmaker. Kelly and I are talking a lot about change in this episode of For the Love. So if change has found your doorstep, it can be uncomfortable. It can be painful. It can even be devastating and difficult to work through. But when we choose to lean into it and we're brave enough to listen to our inside voices here, change can be an incredible teacher and a great and wonderful thing in the end. However, we often need support in that leaning in process right? That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. Therapy has been an absolutely enormous part for me in sorting out and working through both life-altering changes and even now small transitions. So when it comes to BetterHelp, they have made it more affordable and a lot easier for you to have access to a professional therapist on your own schedule. Because in seasons of change, uh, we just sometimes can't handle one more thing that feels hard, right? You can talk to your BetterHelp therapist from anywhere. In as soon as 24 hours from right now, like you don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. Plus they have therapists who specialize in a wide range of different expertises. So it's time to get support for whatever big and small changes you are facing today. You deserve it. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy and my podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp dot com slash for the love. Isn't that great? That's B E T T E R H E L P dot com slash for the love for 10% off your first month. The way that you came to fame was so great. It was like towards the end of the year and you were having a fit about the Mm -hmm. amount of stuff that your teachers were asking you to do in April and May for your children. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny and so true. And it totally ripped the lid off of this idea Mm -hmm. of what is reasonable to expect Mm -hmm. of a parent and their children as the year is grinding to its end. I wouldn't go back to those elementary school year grinded out. There's not a price tag. Like I can't, the, the, all of it. I'm so, don't you love having big kids? 
I just had a, like a PTSD feeling inside my heart of just <laughs> the endless grind of getting kids through school. It, it is a grind. But I the thing that used to happen in those days that I really miss is that Edward would get up and go to work and he worked kind of far away. And so it was like a whole yeah. hour commute. And then one kid would come in on one side and then mm. 10 minutes later, the other kid would come in on the other side. And I was really not confused about what mattered in elementary school. Mm. So if we were mm. late, I didn't care. If we forgot the cupcakes, I didn't care. You. Like, it was just like, this is not, you are, you are not going to steal this from me. That's so good. How did you know that at that time? You know, I've always Golly. had, speaking of friendship, I've always had friends who are slightly older. Except mm, for that's you. That's why. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's very helpful because they'll always be telling me things. Their, their rear view mirror is my today. Mm, that's so good. And there's, they'll say like, like my friend Betsy said, oh, just let them forget everything in middle school. Like nothing, uh-huh. it doesn't no. count. No. Like let it all the chips fall because nothing matters. And it's like your last chance to grow without any yeah. sort of painful downstream consequences. God, that is so true. Like, you know, I've got three of my kids are launched. And so Ben is a senior and Remy's a sophomore. And we were talking through in November, kind of end of the semester coming up, grades, finals, just all that stuff. And they were, you know, bemoaning the facts. And I just said, listen, I was not trying to be funny. I'm like, (laughs) I honestly, like, I don't care what your final grades are. This isn't Harvard. Just whatever. Let's just finish. And they're like, great. <laughs> like mom's really phoning it in here with number four and number five. I'm it's like, it so doesn't matter. Stupid. It's all so I know now. stupid. Everybody can yeah. bloom when they bloom. It's dumb. That's right. That's right. I know now that it really doesn't matter. Like your beautiful little young adult life is going to unfold with or without this like chemistry grade. So just, let's just get through it. God, can we just get out of school? Give me one more change of the last year and a half and then I'll share my reading. I know now that really no matter what happens to me and if whatever my future looks like, whoever comes or doesn't come into my life, whatever happens, I am 100% capable enough to handle it. I might have said I knew this, you know, two years ago, but I really didn't. It wouldn't have been fully true, but like I can do this. I've, I trust myself now in ways that I didn't trust myself before. I trust my own instincts. I trust my own red flags. I trust my own body. Like my body is a conduit of information to my brain, which I never used to listen to. So I trust what my body is telling me. I believe in my own best instincts. And so that's new for me. That's really, really new. I think I would have been a little bit more of a subservient to other people's opinions and expectations of me, what they needed or wanted, what they thought about what I was doing has always had an outsized role in my life. Mm. Which is so dangerous when you're a public figure because it's quantified. I mean, it's, it's not only is it, do you suspect that people might think this or that about you? There's evidence in your feed every day. Like, ooh, right. lots of hearts on that one. Ooh, not so many That's on right. that one. That's right. And the evidence is conflicting. So you've got to pick which group do you want to play to, right? So what a mess. That's just shifting sand. I mean, that is that yeah, is. Yeah, then too you shifting. can't hear yourself. So, you can't hear yourself. There is no self in there. It's only pleasing. And so I am probably now my own North Star for the first time in my life. And so it feels good. I, I feel like, you know who won't betray me or mm. lead me astray or lie to me, me. And so that's so that huge. Is, it's huge. And I, I feel it every day of my life. I feel it in my, at the cellular level. Mm. Even the most traumatic changes that we go through can produce the most beautiful outcomes. Yes. Um, and that's, that's it for me. And maybe, maybe sometimes that's the only road to the beautiful outcome. Ugh, I hate that. And I don't know but that. I think and, it's true. But, but you know, if you talk to people about their life stories, they often hinge on I know. at least something unexpected and often something very hard. God, it's so real. I don't want that to be true. I want our most monumental personal growth and development and change because, to come because everything in our life is happy and perfect. But that is not how it works. Doesn't seem um, typical to me. <laughs> the, 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 it doesn't seem typical. Yeah, because if, if you're so comfortable, like what would inspire the change? Like change is discomfort, and so what? What? That's you, right. It would have to just be that you're in such discomfort that the discomfort of change is less than your current That's discomfort. Right. 
our better selves seem to be forged in the fire. That's where they get just refined and clearer. And so I'm trying to learn that when change has found my doorstep, whether I chose it or it chose me, that even if it is fully just uncomfortable, like you just said, if it hurts, if it's painful, even if it's devastating, that if I can if I can stay there, if I can lean into it, if I can be brave enough, it will become a teacher. And I'd be wise to pull up a chair at the table and see what it has to tell me, see mm-hmm. what it has to teach me, see where I can grow, what I can learn, what I can reassess, reimagine. And that's just unfortunately been really, really true for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you said something about listening to your body and that's mm. been a change for me in, in terms of this mindset, which is, you know, I used to have panic attacks. Like in, in my, yeah. or when I was 30, I had like a little string of panic attacks. And so I went yep. to see this incredible woman and she said, well, before we talk about anything, let's talk about your sleep, what you're eating, mm. if you're drinking, if you're smoking, and if you're having caffeine. Mm. And The takeaway from that, which took me, you know, another 20 years to get my head around is that sometimes there's a physiological wave that we might accidentally attach some causality to. Sometimes it's just like a little wave and it's looking for a story Mm -hmm. to rationalize why you feel that way. When my life unraveled that summer, Brene called me. Mm. My favorite thing about Brene Brown is that she just shoots straight. She's not gentle. She's not like going to coddle you or like be the one who's really like emotionally. (laughs) No, no, no. So she calls me and she's like, first of all, the very first thing you need to do right now, stop drinking, eat only healthy foods, Mm. get at least eight hours of sleep at night, start doing yoga, figure out how to get meditation into your day every single day. She's like, your body right now needs to be absolutely optimized and fueled. If Brene Brown tells you to do something, you do it. So, <laughs> uh, you know, she's the leader of the free world. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't know how to meditate. I guess I'll download this app. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'm still spending $14.99 a month for my simple <laughs> habits app because meditation meant so much to me. Right. It was such a healing tool and all those things are right. I love that we can both trust our bodies and take good care of them so that they continue to send us the messages that we need and keep us safe and keep us protected. And it's so easy to get there if you do the little trick in your head of like, what if I was my body's mother? Mm, I love that. You know, of like, what what if I, if I were my mm. mother, I would say, sweetie, let's make a cup mm. of tea. Let's run a bath. Mm. Why don't you lie mm. down? Like, I'm going to go so get good. you a heating pad. You know, yep. would That's you right. like a piece of toast? Like, Let's just do some soothing Mm. on the more physical side because we are animals. I mean, the whole thing, the whole experience we're having, we're having through a physical machine. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so my reading, interestingly, is about a change that I anticipated that didn't really happen. And it's this has happened to me before, which is to say that when I'm in the space around loss or illness or disease or really like fatality Mm. that I would think that I would no longer be as vulnerable to petty thoughts and complaints. Mm. And so uh, after my dad died, I, I was, you know, kind of moping around the house and I was in this gigantic red bathrobe that makes me look like a troll And this very sporty UPS man came barreling down my front walk. And just the sight of him made me feel like I had crawled out from under a bridge. And then he handed me this little envelope and it was from J. Crew, and I had bought this little top in the final sale section because that's where I like to be. And I went upstairs and it's linen and I put it on and I... It just was so tight that like mm-hmm. you could, my bra outline was like the Golden Gate Bridge. Like you could see I love this story. every bit of my bra and mm. I was jammed in this thing and then I'm wiggling to get out and there's just no lycra whatsoever. And I just got so frustrated and upset that I, I looked over and there were a pair of craft scissors and I just cut the shirt <laughs> right up the middle. Yep. And I was staring at myself 
in the bathroom mirror in, you know, like my new vest and couldn't believe Mm. that I was still capable of hitting that note, even though Mm. I was so full of grief most of the rest of those days. And I was reflecting back on this guy. So Edward worked at Medium, which is an internet Mm. publishing platform and social media place And Uh so anyway, I used to write there and they had all the things that internet startups have. You know, they have a kombucha bar and they have meatless Mondays and they have a meditation teacher who comes twice a day. He gives these like little talks while you're meditating. He kept repeating this phrase, it's like this. Uh And there's something about that that I really tucked away. It was like a song lyric. I I don't know how to quite explain what he means, but Mm. it's working for me. Like, it's like this, it's like this. You're picking up this reading on that very day. I'm done peeing. I flush and tie Greenie's giant pajama bottoms back around my waist. I spit a mouthful of toothpaste in the sink, rinse and bare my teeth for inspection. I relax my face. I exhale. I console my reflection. It's like this, Kelly. This is how it goes. Hidden in the morning's frustrations, like a rattlesnake in the woodpile, is something else. I close my eyes so I can listen for the other thing, the further away, much worse thing, in the quiet of my own head. Life ends. I've known this since the summer of 1972 when an ambulance drove away in silence with the old lady down the street who gave out almond joys on Halloween. But now I've seen mortality do its awful ghosting up close twice, and that has changed the context of everything. In the new Zodiac, without Greeny, without my friend Liz, all terms have been recalibrated. Pain is agony. Bad is fatal. The scale is reset, making it hard for me to reconcile what I've seen with how I live. Liz would have done a week of aggressive bromodomain inhibitors at Cedar sinai for one morning of hairballs, eggshells, and toenail clippings. Mm. To see her kids become teenagers screaming obscenities at each other in the hall, she'd have given up every organ in her pelvic cavity. Hmm. Then there's Greeny, who would have told you that life was a carnival. All music and snack stalls, fortune tellers and strong men. It's magical, lovey. Edward called Greeny a happiness genius, but ask anyone. He was as excited about being alive as anyone you will ever meet. This isn't a kid making a hero out of her dad. Mm. And me, I walked next to him in that festival light for almost 50 years. And then one night in February, his hand went still in mine. And here I am, same as ever except quicker to anger and 13 pounds heavier. Shouldn't loss change a person for the better, forever? Maybe Will's curious phrase, it's like this, applies here too. This forgetting, this slide into smallness, this irritability and shame, this disorienting grief, it's like this. Minds don't rest. They reel and wander and fixate and roll back and reconsider because it's like this, having a mind. Hearts don't idle. They swell and constrict and break and forgive and behold. Because it's like this, having a heart. Lives don't last. They thrill and confound and circle and overflow and disappear. Because it's like this, having a life. I love that essay so much. You're such a good writer. Don't you have that experience where something terrible has happened in your circle? You know, like my friend Liz was... 46 years old. She left three kids, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old. Like you think giving that eulogy, you think I'll never complain again. But you Uh, will. You will complain again. I'd like to think that when we're really old ladies, Mm. kind of near the end of our lives and we've seen it all and we've done it all and we've heard it all, experienced it all, that it will take so much to rattle our cages at Mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. You know, that we just have this softness that age only and time only can give you. We're getting better at it. We're better now than we were a decade ago. I'd like to think we're getting a little better. You know who thinks we are? Oh. It would be Grainy if he were here and it's <laughs> definitely Larry. Yeah. They think we were born great. Yeah. Born yeah. great. No improvement needed. Whether you're running a small business or working from home or juggling 
1,600 things every second counts. You don't want to waste a single second, and neither do I, especially not when it comes to running errands that already feel hard and time-consuming, like going to the post office. Why is it so hard? That is where stamps.com enters the chat. They make mailing and shipping quick and easy and cost-effective. We use stamps.com in Jen Hatmaker land for everything because you have access to all USPS and UPS services literally right from your laptop. When you use stamps.com to mail and ship, you get access to exclusive discounts and great rates on shipping, like literally to the tune of up to 30% off USPS rates and up to 86% off UPS, you guys. All you need is your regular computer and a printer. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for literally any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. Plus, Stamps.com seamlessly works with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, all that stuff. So stop wasting time and start saving money when you use Stamps.com to mail and ship. You can sign up with the promo code for the love for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital scale. And there's no long-term commitments or contracts. Don't worry about any of that. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page and enter the code for the love. Parents, we can all use a little help from our friends and parents of tweens and teens. If you know, you know. This is especially true because they're maniacs, God bless them. This particular age group has its own set of challenges and bumps and roadblocks to navigate. And it all just feels like a lot because it is. That's why I developed a me course to guide you through this season that's jam-packed with my greatest learnings over the years and practical, actionable steps forward. Okay, and I brought in a friend and shame-proof parenting expert, Mercedes Samudio for this course to help us do it all without shame, because we know the feeling of parent shame is a real and debilitating thing. So we're going to cover how to establish healthy communication, what to do about codependency, which may not be what you think it is. So much more. It's all in here. And I can tell you a lot of my personal stories of my successes and failures as a parent, having done this five times now. We've also packed this me course to the brim with so many resources to help you parent your kids in the healthiest, most connected, non-shaming way. And not just non-shaming for them, non-shaming for you. So if you have questions about parenting your growing kiddos, this is your course. When you register, You also get access to our private me course support community of beautiful humans just like you. We're doing limited time pricing for the parenting me course. You can save $20 with the code parenting20 at mecourse.org. We're also doing a bundle deal for all four of my current me courses for $138, which you guys is half off. That's the most incredible deal. The other three me courses are finances, simplicity, and habits, okay? Your code is four course bundle, the number four, four course bundle at mecourse.org. That's mecourse.org. Tell me about your reading. So I'm going a different direction. Some change is external. It's It, it maybe starts internally, but then it has external effects because it's going to require structural changes or a career change. In general, our people don't love us to change. They're used to us in the version that we are in right now, which no doubt is keeping a handful of their balls in the air too. Like we're, we're tending to some of the ways that they want to live and what they do or don't want to do in the world as is. And sometimes when we make changes and it's going to affect them, they're like, well, I want your full availability, you know, or I still want to be the center of the universe in the way that I am right now for you. I love some change for myself, but I, it rubs up against me internally when my people do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our first question is how's this going to affect me? And so I thought I might do a little reading about change and the responses that we ought to expect to get so that we don't get knocked down when they happen. This is good. This is really good. And so this is a reading from Fierce, Free and Full of Fire, my last book, Mm -hmm. out of a chapter called I Want This Dream. And so in this context, I'm talking about change in terms of chasing something new that you want. 
It's a new career. It's a new skill. It's a new path. You're hanging up one way that you've always been to pick up something that you're really hungry for, which is celebrated when you're 21. But when you're 47, less so. Mm. So, okay, here we go. Got a dream? Show up for it. Assemble your squad and then hit step one. Say it out loud. It's powerful, this vulnerable move. Now it's real. You've put some language around it, pulled it into the light. That inside dream just got born on the outside where people can see it. You've given it the respect it deserves by naming it, assigning it some heft, breathing life into its lungs. This is not a small step. Okay, this next paragraph was back when I was married. So let's just redact those portions. Okay, I remember explicitly the day back in 2004. I told Brandon I wanted to write a book. It was March. And according to my spawning cycle, it was my summer to have another baby after popping them out in April, 1998, May, 2000, and June, 2002. We were drowning in toddlers and preschoolers. And I was watching other people's kids part-time to the tune of around $150 a week. Brandon was working 11 million hours while storing the notion that surely I was about to return to the classroom because I was a teacher. He'd walk in the door every day and find his formerly lovely, kempt, stable wife sporting the same sloppy clothes I woke up in, children hanging off all my parts, and a wild, desperate look on my face. I now recognize with perfect clarity on moms shopping with their littles at Target. (laughs) I can't actually believe he ever drove home after work. So to this mix of early childhood, financial instability, and zero margin, I whispered, instead of having another baby this summer, I think I'll write a book. At this juncture, let's talk about possible reactions to your announcement. (laughs) Sometimes your thing will make neither hide nor hair of sense. It will sound absurd. For example, you may want to write a book and not even have a computer. Also, no one is asking you to write a book, so there's that. (laughs) Or maybe it's just that so many people live in your home. Adding a new thing feels somewhere between hilarious and psychotic. Perhaps someone expected you to take a different path or rejoin a former one, or make a choice with a more guaranteed outcome. Those who love us aren't keen on our failure or rejection, and their fear for us sometimes shows up as discouragement. It could be that your idea is going to cost not just you, but your people something, and you're right on both counts, and they will feel anxious about this development. Let it be said that folks probably prefer you to keep doing exactly what you are doing so as not to interrupt their lives. And it's not because your people are monsters, They are just monster adjacent, as we all are. Another potential pool of reactions involves old-fashioned jealousy or its cousin, self-loathing. The thing is, we all have dreams. Everyone has a gift. Human beings are literally wired for lives of meaning. So occasionally, your ambition will rub up against someone else's dormant desire, and that feels bad to them. Mm -hmm. Your forward movement reminds them of their own stagnation. So an easy shot is to say, you're a big dummy, a try-hard, conceited doomed to fail. Now notice you won't typically receive that response from people neck deep in their own awesome stuff. Those guys will be thrilled for you. When folks are running their own race, they're excited to see other runners lace up their shoes. While it's good to be prepared for any number of reactions, decide in advance that you are not asking for permission. You may appropriately be open to feedback, but not dismissal. This is a huge part of becoming an integrated woman. You have agency over your own life and it is not up for grabs. Obviously, be willing to receive good counsel or strategic advice or useful suggestions as to your path forward, but that does not include handing your dream over for rejection. It isn't theirs to reject. It belongs to you, and you are its mother and father, its doting aunt and closest sister, its bodyguard and lead blocker. Protect it in its undeveloped infant stage. Who else will? Mm. I'm always really careful. Who I first reveal my little mm. germ yeah. of a of a concept to. Because I don't I think a lot of people are not like early stage investors. I think a lot of people don't get it. They've they've never yep. tried something to make something from scratch. They don't know everything you know. And there's a neediness for me when I'm sharing it that's sort of unfair to the listener because it's really the only appropriate answer that I'm looking for is that's cool. You should look into that. <laughs> That's right. So I'm not really, it's not really a fair kind of communication because it's a call and response. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm telling you what I want to hear. That's good. And if you don't give it to me, you failed me. 
So That's why right. put the pressure on people? Like I don't give Edward my books until way later. Like that was a mm. huge, huge learning curve. I like that addition that choose your confidants wisely and in stages when That's you are right. rolling out something new at the very beginning when it's just a little tiny seed of an idea all the way to like development and completion. Different people will cheer you on in different ways and at different times. And you'll learn who those people are. I think that's really great wisdom to add. But in the end, the only person who can really ultimately say, I'm going to see this through no matter how hard and long it is, longer and harder than most people expected, or I've, I think I've false started here and I want to go back to the drawing board is you. you you're right. the one who gets to make that decision. You're the, you're the final word. I love that we're talking about change and that we can be honest about what's hard about that, both internally and externally, and that it's still worth it. That's my position. Change makes us fuller, rounder, more compassionate human people as it brings us closer to alignment into what we love, what we're good at, what has meaning to us, what brings us to life. All of that forward progress is worth it. And so we couldn't expect any of it to come without some opposition. Yeah. All of it, we should just expect to have conflict baked in. And it's our work to handle that with graciousness, but also with resolve and power through. Yeah, resolve, resolve, resolve. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to treat you to a Kate Bayer poem. She's really awesome. So she has this poem called Advice for Former Selves. Burn your speeches, your instructions, your prophecies too. In the morning, when you wake, stretch. Do not complain. Do not set sail on someone else's becoming. Their voice in your throat. Do not look down your nose at a dinner party, laughing if only they didn't have so many children. Revision is necessary, the compulsory bloom. When you emerge with crystals in one hand, revenge in the other, remember the humble barn swallow who returns in spring, if not for her markings, another bird entirely. Mm, that's so good. Isn't she good? We're so lucky to have the poets. I know, God bless the poets. So will you come <sighs> back next week and talk to me about friendship? I will, let's do it. All right. See you later. Okay, friend. Hey, everybody. Jen here dropping in with a real quick announcement that we're super excited about. We are launching a premium podcast on Apple Podcasts. So what is a premium podcast? Well, it's the same great show that you've come to know and love every single week, but with a few extra features. Subscribers to the premium podcast will get, first of all, earlier access to the show each week. Also, all of the shows will be commercial free. And finally, we'll have some really great exclusive content from yours truly and extra bonus episodes featuring a variety of amazing guests as well. And all of this goodness starts on Apple Podcasts on July 19th. So head on over to For the Love with Jen Hatmaker podcast channel on Apple Podcasts and hit subscribe. It's only $2.99 a month for all these great features, early access, no commercials, and exclusive bonus content. You're going to love it. <laughs>